Hi everyone, welcome to today's broadcast. This webinar is being brought to you by the Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project. Our topic today is the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative. And our host today is Todd Olinsky-Paul. Uh, to begin with, I would like to go over some quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants today will be in listen-only mode throughout the broadcast, so we will not be able to hear you. You can connect to the audio portion of the webinar using your computer speakers or a headset, or you can listen in via telephone. We do suggest that you listen in via your computer to avoid telephone charges, but if you are listening to us today, please enter the audio pin into your telephone keypad. This will allow us to keep track of you throughout the broadcast. And today we are encouraging all of our participants to please type in your questions as you think of them into the question box on your webinar console. We will read all of your questions and queue them up and answer them at the end of the presentation today as time allows. So again, enter those as you think of them. We will queue them up and answer them at the end. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar as well as all of the webinar slides as a PDF online on our website at the web address you see on your screen. And with that, I'd like to pass this over to Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is our project director for the Resilient Power Project. Todd, please go ahead. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Todd Olinsky-Paul from Clean Energy Group. And uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'd like to do a brief introduction, and then we will go right into our main presentation. Uh, with Amy McGuire from Massachusetts DOER. Uh, for the, any of you who don't know, Clean Energy Group is a uh, nonprofit advocacy organization, and we work with uh, we work with many different uh, stakeholders, including states, municipalities, and industry, um, federal government, and others, on uh, areas of clean energy and climate change. Could you advance the slide, please? Uh, this uh, particular webinar is one of a series in our Resilient Power Project. This project was uh, started, uh, basically, got, really got underway after Hurricane Sandy, when a number of states in the Northeast came together and asked uh, Clean Energy Group to help to facilitate some information sharing and uh, policy uh, support uh, in order to help them put together resilient power programs for critical infrastructure facilities uh, to be better prepared for the, the next storm. And as we've seen, there's uh, you know been many grid outages due to not only storms on the East Coast, but uh, many other types of natural disasters across the country, including wildfires, uh, including tornadoes, hurricanes, um, even uh, you know, uh, ice storms, drought, that sorts of things. So uh, we, are, we are working with states across the country and increasingly with municipalities to get resilient power deployed at critical infrastructure so that the services that are most needed can be provided when the grid is down because they will be uh, they will have on-site islanding and generation capacity. So, uh, next slide, please. We are fortunate today to have Amy McGuire to present the uh, Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative being administered by the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, or DOER. And um, I do have a, a bit of background uh, information, which I can't seem to access at the moment, on Amy, so I'm going to let her introduce uh, herself with any background that she wants to give. The only thing I do recall is that she was previously a professional cyclist, which is quite exciting. But uh, Amy, if you're ready to go, let's uh, go ahead and queue up Amy's slides and uh, start the main presentation. I would like to say, uh, while, while we're doing this, that um, Two things. One, we always get this question. Yes, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website for uh, review um, after after it's complete. And the other thing is, please send your questions in as they occur to you. 
don't wait till the end, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Okay, Amy? Hi, thank you, Todd. Um, this is Amy McGuire. I work for the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, as Todd, Todd, excuse me, Todd pointed out. Uh, I'm in the Renewables Division here, and I lead our Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative, as well as helping out on a number of different things, including our uh, solar residential loan program and um, solar carve-out program. So um, this is one of our one of my the main things that I work on, and um, I'm really excited to be here today. And thank you to the Clean Energy Group for for hosting. This is this is great. I'm glad to share what we're doing in Massachusetts around this resiliency initiative. When I first spoke to to through this um, medium with the Clean Energy Group uh, was back in February of this year, and we were just working on the design of our program. So it's it's really exciting to share how far we've come and um, and yeah, so some of our results so far. The initiative that I'm going to talk to you about today, the primary focus is to support communities in their efforts to prepare for the impacts of climate change while continuing to meet uh, the Massachusetts Patrick Administration's goals of greenhouse gas emission reductions and increased incorporation of clean energy. So for those less familiar with the program, I'll touch a little bit on the background and reasoning behind this specific initiative and then give you an overview of of what we designed for the program and discuss eligibility of applicants, facilities, and technologies involved, and then go over our particular approach um, and the results that we've had through the program so far. I'll, as Todd mentioned as well, leave plenty of time for questions. So definitely, as, they, as you think of them, uh, type them in, and, and we'll try to get to as many of them as, as possible, if not all. So the initiative was developed out of a clear call to action from Governor Patrick. In discussing the realities of climate change last July, the governor said, we need to do more to address the extreme threats from climate change. We must properly assess the risks and vulnerabilities, plan for them, and ensure our emergency services have the ability to keep our residents safe. And we must take action to protect our natural habitats to maintain healthy communities. From this call came a set of coordinated climate preparedness initiatives, so not just the one I work on, but several across all of our state agencies. All, all of them, though, are focused on investments that will have the most effective, immediate, and long-lasting impact. The goal is to prepare for climate change and the increasing incidence of severe and costly weather events. As you can see in the chart, Below, the economic cost of major weather events has increased dramatically in the last few years, and that is not counting the human impact, of course. Seven of the 10 costliest storms ever in US history occurred between 2004 and 2012, and with the average annual cost being between 18 and $33 billion a year. In 2012 alone, the cost of these major weather events was $110 billion. So in Massachusetts, we decided to invest in new technologies to increase our energy infrastructure resiliency and reliability, and hopefully reduce that economic burden, um, as well as supporting our residents, as Governor Patrick stated. The Climate Preparedness Initiatives, in total, um, involved committing $52 million in preparing for climate change, and that was announced in January of this year. As I said, these efforts are coordinated across many state agencies. The Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs is working with the New England Power Generators Association, identifying resiliency efforts at our generation facilities. The Department of Public Utilities has an ongoing grid modernization effort that certainly is looking to the impacts of climate change and how that affects our grid. The Coastal Zone, Office of Coastal Zone Management um, received a budget of $10 million to address coastal infrastructure projects. Department of Conservation and Recreation is working with 
Massachusetts Department of Transportation to assess the vulnerabilities in that area in transportation. And DOER is working with the Governor's Military Task Force to evaluate clean energy opportunities at the military bases across Massachusetts and looking at energy resiliency, which is a significant concern, of course, for the Department of Defense. The Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative is aimed at clean energy technology providing resiliency to critical facilities in municipalities. And that's what we're going to focus on today, really keeping the power on through emergency events when the broader grid faces an outage. The Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative is a $40 million municipal grant program focused on ensuring energy resiliency at critical facilities using clean energy technology. And I'll get into the details of all those facets in a moment. But uh, I did want to cover the fact that this opportunity allowed cities and towns of, of Massachusetts to apply for support for eligible projects by completing and submitting uh, either technical assistance or project implementation applications in the first round. And then in the second round, which just um, took place this November with the deadline November 10th for project implementation in that second round. As far as eligible applicants, all, all Massachusetts municipalities were eligible. That was the main focus. We wanted to make sure we could reach all citizens of the Commonwealth. A single municipality could apply for either um, technical assistance or project, project implementation. Sorry. We also allowed for joint applications by multiple municipalities that might want to work together on a project that was multiple communities with one facility. We also allowed for regional planning agencies and regional districts such as water, wastewater, and school to look for, at applications as well. Finally, we did also allow for public-private partnerships, so where a facility might be owned and operated either publicly or privately it could also be eligible, with the lead applicant just needing to be the public entity. And a memorandum of understanding required between the two parties. That way, allowing a facility to provide critical functions for public benefit in the case of an emergency. So sometimes it would just make sense for a private facility to be a prioritized um, facility in this in this case. So that is a nice segue to what the eligible facilities were that we looked at. And we defined critical facilities as buildings or structure where loss of electrical service would result in disruption of a critical public safety life-sustaining function. And we further prioritize those as life safety resources, lifeline resources, and community resources. The first, the life safety resources would be police stations, fire stations, hospitals, water and wastewater treatment plants, emergency communication resources, and shelters. So your number one facilities for providing public safety. Lifeline resources would include food and su food supply and transportation resources. And then community resources we saw as places like city and town halls that would provide um, facilities that where the city function or municipal function could act as the headquarters during an emergency, senior centers or multifamily housing developments that could act as alternative shelters where people were housed in place, and that those types of facilities. Now, moving on to what type of technology we're looking for, the program, the $40 million budget funding came through what we call our alternative compliance payments through the renewable portfolio standard that we have in Massachusetts. And that those compliance payments are dictate the, the how we can spend the funding. 
and in particular focus on clean energy. So that really helped us define what type of technologies we, we could cover through our project funding. We were focused on clean energy generation and storage, energy management systems, and the technology used for operation in island mode. And we were looking at single building isolation or microgrid configuration, which we determined to be multiple interconnected buildings served by distributed generation and able to operate in parallel with or islanded from the broader utility grid. So we were able to cover a large range of facilities and technologies under the program. As I mentioned earlier, we did take a two-pronged approach to our program that allowed for either technical assistance or project implementation in the first round. And in, under technical assistance, we, be, we were able to offer a no cost towards applicants so technical support from the consulting team made up of the Cadmus Group and MCFA and Homer Energy. And then awarded applicants had the opportunity to use the resulting plan to apply for follow-up round of project implementation funding. So you could take the technical support and use it as a foundation to move forward to actually install a project at a specific facility. We're quite, quite pleased with the interest. We received 27 applications for our July 15th deadline, and we're able to award all of those. So we made the awards on a rolling basis, allowing the consulting team to work carefully with each uh, awarded applicant, and we're able to cover all four regions of the Commonwealth, which again was a, a, a goal, and we were quite pleased with that. We did have 43 standalone facilities analyzed, so independent um, single facilities, and then five microgrid configurations, so the interconnected buildings that I mentioned earlier. All of those reports were completed in October of this year. This next slide, though a bit overwhelming, I wanted to give you a snapshot of all the different projects that we were looking at in through technical assistance. So these are the awarded applicants, the facilities they were focused on, and the technology that was reviewed at each facility. And, and as a bit of a summary, shelters were a primary focus uh, with 20 school senior centers or early childhood centers uh, a focus here. We also had 12 public safety buildings or facilities that were analyzed, and six Department of Public Works buildings, most with fueling stations to support uh, public um, vehicles that provide support during an emergency. We also looked at six water or wastewater treatment plants, two hospitals, and three communication towers uh, or facilities that per supported emergency communication I wanted to go into some, highlight some some examples from these. So I'll just pull out four different cases that were either particular interesting or had something unique about them. The first one I'll highlight is the Amherst UMass project. And uh, right away you'll notice that that's a combined effort between the town of Amherst and the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. So that public-private partnership was something we were interested in and glad to support. The University of Massachusetts Amherst has a microgrid on their campus, and the study that they did through the technical assistance was to look at incorporating some of the town's critical facilities into that microgrid, allowing for electricity and thermal support through an emergency but simply just through an emergency, so not incorporating them into the microgrid on an ongoing basis, but offering that emergency support. So there's significant uh, combined heat and power there, as well, and 
there was a look to add uh, solar, full, solar photovoltaic panels on the Champion Center, which is a new basketball facility that could serve as a large shelter, and then uh, battery backup as well. So the wastewater treatment plant and the fire station would be the town facilities, and then the Champion Center would serve as a public shelter for all the residents of Amherst, the students as well as the local population. So it's really an interesting configuration with the microgrid extension and um, a great example of a public-private partnership. Another example is the Beverly Emergency Supply Cash Site. This is a regional supply site, cash site, support, or established by the Northeast Homeland Security Advisory Council, Council NERAC. So it houses all sorts of emergency vehicles and supplies that might be called upon during any emergency in the northeast part of the state. And while not terribly exciting as far as building functionality, they're warehouses, but the importance of this site for supporting the state during an emergency event really struck us as a, an interesting case and one that we should look to, to study through the technical assistance. And the focus was around solar, PV, and battery storage to uh, support and enhance the existing backup generators that are on site. Another example I wanted to point out was the Holyoke Mount Tom Tower. This one it, the Mount Tom Tower offers emergency communication services to the to the city of Holyoke, uh, and because of its unique site on the top of Mount, Ta Mount, Mount Tom, there was some interesting challenges around what sort of generation might fit there, and we were focused with the technical assistance around small scale PV, solar PV, as well as micro wind turbines combined with battery storage as the main technologies to support that tower. So some very interesting combinations of, of technology at that site. And the last example I wanted to pull out here is the Northampton microgrid. That um, technical assistance was, again, an interesting collaboration as well as a microgrid configuration that offered, offers its own challenges. It, again, is a public-private partnership where, the, where Northampton is looking to use the, a shelter at the high school in conjunction with Department of Public Works facility as well as the hospital there, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, that linking all those together and providing a really robust emergency support system of facilities. So those are just a few of the many uh, examples of, of really interesting projects that we were able to study through technical systems. The, as I mentioned earlier, the other portion of our round one applications were those that were ready to go directly into project implementation. So the technical assistance really was there to support any applicants that maybe had a strong interest in looking at resiliency but not a clear direction on how to do that or what to focus on, whereas the project implementation applications were more well advanced and ready to move forward and simply missing the funding for the projects. So we did have really specific um, criteria, of course, using the eligible clean technologies, of course, at the eligible critical facilities. Uh, we wanted to make sure that any project could demonstrate strategic electric isolation of critical loads from non-critical building loads to then effectively extend resiliency capability. That means just that we want to reduce the load as much as possible at a critical facility and only need to power that portion of a building's typical load. The project should be able to operate in parallel or islanded to, from the main grid. Of course, meet any utility interconnection strategy guidelines 
and follow, follow all of our funding guidelines for the initiative. One thing I didn't mention earlier, but we also were looking at pro any project for, could be a retrofit or a new installation of distributed generation. So all range of, of projects. We were we did receive nine applications in that uh, July at that July deadline, and we're able to award six of those projects with funding uh, for a total of seven point four million dollars. And that announcement was made in September. The remaining three applications, we uh, requested that they come to the second round of project implementation, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the, the projects were not, it's not that they were poor projects, but we wanted to see a little bit more work on, done on them, on the applications, and then we'd review them again in the second round. So we did allow the opportunity for that resubmission. Um, and I'm sorry, I <laughs> four. We actually had um, one project that didn't meet, get its full funding amount requested in the first round. So we had three that um, didn't receive any and one that um, went received a little less than requested. So we were reconsidered four in the second round. Sorry about that. Um, and we were happy with the three regions of the Commonwealth supported. Uh, and the range of different types of, of facilities that we were able to look at. So that said, here is a snapshot of those six that were awarded and what we, what we awarded them for. The first one is the Totten Berkeley Community Microgrid. And as stated, it's a microgrid focused around five facilities in the community that would all be interconnected and islanded together in an emergency with a specific energy management system and using a battery backup in conjunction with existing solar and diesel generators to serve all the loads there. The Boston projects were four community shelters in different places across the city that would use solar and storage that, again, could island and operate independently to serve those shelters. The, they were selected to support the most vulnerable communities, some of the most vulnerable communities in Boston, but also to serve shelters that weren't at major risk for flooding so could really be destinations should other parts of the city be impacted by, um, by flooding during an emergency event. The Greater Lawrence Sanitary District Project, Organics to Energy Upgrade Project, is a really interesting one involving islandable and black start capable self-sustaining water, wastewater treatment. And this facility uses anaerobic digestion, and they look to collect the biogas and store it, that, the results of that anaerobic digestion, and then use it to power to combine heat and power systems that would provide all the electricity and thermal, no, look, thermal needs of the facility, essentially allowing the whole thing to operate independently of the grid on an ongoing basis. So not just during an emergency, but, but on an ongoing basis. Northampton is a battery and PV islanding capability for the fire headquarters. Again, partner combining solar PV with battery storage uh, and, and existing diesel generators to really provide long-term backup for that essential critical facility in Northampton. And then the last two, the South Essex Sewers District and the Bay State Health, Code, um, Bay State Health Hospital, we're both looking at islandable and black start natural gas combined heat and power, and we were able to support them in with the, those that equipment that provides that capability, the islanding and the black start capability. Um, so, in, in in all very good projects, and we're pleased to to make those awards in September. As I 
said, we did have a second round of project implementation that was open to anyone who came through our technical assistance as we wanted to make sure and financially support those that analysis and to those four that uh, were good projects but went either unfunded or only partially funded in the first round. So they had the same threshold criteria and the same ability to look at projects that would be a retrofit or new installation. But we did add the possibility for phased contracts, which was, um, I think, a good addition in light of the results of the technical assistance we, we, uh, and the, the applicants were in, very, are very interested in the, in the projects that they've um, analyzed through the technical assistance in particular. But some questions still remained as to feasibility and full engineering did not happen through the technical assistance. That, that was not the intent and, and full engineering, of course, would be necessary for uh, final implementation. So what we decided was that we could offer to phase the contract so that the first contract, uh, an awardee would get two contracts, the first covering funds for design engineering through the interconnection impact study, so full engineering essentially of the project, and then make a decision whether to move to the second contract which would cover costs for the full construction. And that way, the risk on both ends is reduced. So if a, a city or town found that through engineering the costs would exceed anything they had expected or applied for through the program, they could choose to uh, not go forward. Or if they found some fatal flaw in through that engineering process, I, they would not need to um, go forward with the project. And the same on DOER's end, we could have another chance to carefully decide whether an, a project made sense to complete. So the we did receive 13 applications on November 10th. So not all the technical assistance projects came through, but a good percentage of them. And those cover all four regions of the Commonwealth and include single facilities and microgrids. And as it says at the top, we're, we're currently reviewing all of these applications and trying our best to try to get an announcement about the awards by the end of this month, um, if not sooner. So working hard to, to make sure we have some, some exciting news for all those applicants soon. So with that, I wanted to go a, a little bit into some a summary of where we are, what we've achieved, and some lessons learned. Um, I, I've mentioned before, but a, a focus of ours was to get some geographic diversity among our applicants and our awarded applicants. And this map is sort of a nice highlight of, of what we were able to award in the first round. And as you can see, we really cover a, a large range of, of municipalities and regions across the Commonwealth. We also were focused on municipal equity in consideration of our awards, um, looking to grant funding support to applicants with a range of different vulnerability factors. So those could be high population density, or uh, a large number of high need individuals, or a remote area, or flood risk, or whatever risk that, that particular town, city, town, region has all across the Commonwealth. And we were pleased that we were able to really cover all those different types of things through the awarded projects and technical assistance. We also looked at and, and achieved a wide range of facilities and technologies uh, to be both considered in the technical assistance and project implementation. And as you saw, we had single facility projects and microgrid configurations. And the, both of those things really allowed us to meet specific needs and priorities of the applicants and have a range of different types of projects to learn from in the future. We're confident that these are really good, 
functional projects, but um, we know that a lot of this technology is new and, and we will be learning from their experience. So it's really good for all of us to have the ability to, to really see different things in, in practice and in place. And finally, it was a focus of the initiative to support projects that demonstrated both daily benefits and the ability to island and operate and provide resilient support to a facility and thereby a community. So these are much more than just emergency backup systems. And then on to some lessons learned through the whole process. I think it was certainly really important to learn and share with as many people as possible throughout the program development and design and also through our implementation phases, be that for the technical systems or a project implementation aspect. Um, we met with all sorts of different people in the early stages, the di different states around the region and the country. Um, certainly learning from places like Connecticut and New York and New Jersey from their experience and met with different uh, organizations, be they resiliency focused or energy focused, the utilities in Massachusetts and technology vendors to really learn about what we needed to focus on here. As well as Massachusetts organizations and municipalities and policymakers. So we met with the representatives from, from those types of entities and got feedback all along the way. I think it was also really important to develop clear goals in our program design. We prioritized critical facilities and really identified what technologies we were focused on and then allowed for two different approaches with the technical assistance support and direct implementation so that those who were ready to move forward could, but those that needed a little more support and information and learning could also get that and then, and then move forward with the opportunity to implement what they've learned. A third thing is just to be able to provide as much information, and that's generally DOER's role anyway, but particularly when we were focused on uh, something new, clean energy, resiliency, uh, certainly not uh, heavily prevalent yet, but we did provide uh, all sorts of webinars of our own, attended those hosted by others, and extensive Q&A support. I do think one thing we could add, just because, as I said, this is all quite new to a lot of people, um, perhaps more of a glossary of terms, and we're, um, we, would, we could certainly work on that to define everything we're, we're talking about throughout the process, be it um, black start or um, islanding or whatever the jargon is, make sure that everyone is on the same page, as well as just generally making sure uh, the explanation of concepts and technology is, is clear to everyone. And then providing some flexibility throughout the project implementation in particular was an important lesson for us, um, allowing to adjust as we needed, in particular on the, the phased contract approach for the second round. Um, that certainly, I think, will help support our goals, uh, but also with our two-pronged approach initially with the technical assistance and project implementation uh, opportunities. So really, from our initial design all the way through to some adjustments we made in the second round, I think um, do, being open to the flexibility of, and change was, was important. So that's all I had for just now. I'm, I'm, we have a little bit of time, I think, for questions, and I'm uh, excited to hear from you. If you want to see my, oh, try to get my contact information up for you as well while we're doing questions, so if you want to reach out directly, you can also do that. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. That was uh, terrific, and we do have a number of questions. We might have a, um, we may be able to actually get to all these, um, and we'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, first question, somebody wanted to know if the technical details associated with these pro 
projects are available online? Or I guess if they're not now, will they be available online? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, the web link here can take you to our website that where all the technical assistance reports are posted. And then some information on our on the project implementation projects is up there for round one. Um, those are still in the contract phase. So once we get through that, then more information will be able to make public. But um, there, there's some good information up there already, particularly around the technical assistance um, reports. OK, great. And, and I guess a lot in, in line with that, when do you expect to have uh, to be announcing results for the round two deployment? Grants. Yeah. Um, again, good question. We're, we're, as I said earlier, working really hard to make sure that's done definitely before the end of this month, um, but uh, with a clear target before the holidays, so certainly within the next few weeks. Okay. Uh, another person wants to know how the batteries are sized. Uh, there's a lot of PV and battery systems here, uh, and how long do they need to support the load? Did you? I, I don't think you had a a set uh, term for islanded um, uh, support of facilities, right? You you were sort of going on a case by case basis. Um, yes and no. So we did uh, request that a, a project be able to island and operate for at least three days. So we're talking about longish term outage here with um, the desire for longer term uh, operation. Uh, to, to you'd score higher that way. Um, the sizing of the of the batteries is is so very case by case. It would depend on if you had existing backup that could work in conjunction with solar and PV, or sorry, solar and battery systems. So um, where you might use some diesel generator um, support, for example, when necessary, uh, at least minimizing the need to use that diesel fuel, or um, extending the, the number of days that you could run. Um, and yeah, really, it, it really would depend on, on the site and that, that critical load there, as well as other existing generation um, on site. OK, great. You, you mentioned daily benefits and that these are not just back, merely backup systems. Somebody wants to know if you could give some examples of those benefits. Yeah, of course. And actually, I did have a thought on the prior question as well. That for the sizing, we're, to give a sense, we're talking in the range of uh, tens of kilowatt hours to megawatt hours in the, the spectrum of different projects scale we're looking at for battery storage. So it, it really varied. Um, and then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, can you, ask, can you mention the, the question again, Todd, the next question? Yeah, the, the daily benefits, in other words, the, the systems were not merely intended to be uh, there for backup on the, on the rare occasions when the grid is down, but we're supposed to provide benefits on an ongoing basis. And what were the, some of those benefits that you were looking to get from these systems or that the applicants were uh, proposing? Yeah, very good. Um, so the daily benefits, for example, for a CHP system could be simply uh, reduce, save energy savings in general, cost savings, um, and a more efficient system at, instead of a separate electricity usage and a boiler if your facility could support it, for example, at a hospital or a school that might serve as a shelter and really have some load throughout the year. Um, you would get great efficiency out of a CHP system. So that would be a, a daily benefit. Um, and then with islanding technology, if it could operate uh, isolated from the grid, that would be your emergency benefit. Uh, and then for something like PV and storage, again, you, you could certainly see savings um, through a solar system, as well as obviously greenhouse gas emission reductions, and then by using a battery system well, you, it, depending on if a facility was on um, demand charges or time of, time of use rates, you could look to shave peak um, usage during, uh, on a daily basis or monthly basis, and um, even participating in the forward capacity market if your scale of storage is big enough that it could operate as a, um, a peaker. And, even the frequency regulation market. So that's quite 
um, young, I, I would say, in the ISO New England territory, but um, a growing market and one that I know FERC is looking to, to make sure is, is involved. So there's, there's all sorts of different revenue streams and savings that can happen with these types of technologies on a daily basis, as well as providing that resiliency um, to the facilities where they're installed. Right. I think, if I understand it correctly, that uh, ISO New England is supposed to be um, compliant by March with uh, some of the FERC, uh, uh, stand, new FERC standards for frequency regulation and ancillary services uh, markets. Do you Great. happen to, do you know whether um, any of the applicants did include that and would that would that information be in the in the project documentation online? Uh, at this point it's it's more sort of uh, aware of those possibilities but I don't think anyone has really dug into the numbers yet and a lot of that will come out through the engineering and design process to try to capture all of the financial streams of revenue and uh, that will make the project work but um, certainly, we through the technical assistance in particular, and and some of the direct project implementation projects, um, we we had applicants aware of all these things and really looking to take advantage of them. So, it's and it's certainly something we um, strongly encouraged in our solicitation. Great. Uh, we're uh, another question. Were municipalities eligible for technical assistance if they were already working with an engineering firm or a developer? Uh, yeah, we we um, allowed. Certainly, you could still apply for technical assistance and be eligible for it. You were uh, only able to use our our um, consulting team for the technical assistance. So some uh, municipalities actually worked sort of in conjunction and had their they might have had a, an engineering team, for example, on um, retainer or, or working with them already, and they might serve as sort of a, a go-between and um, sort of translator of the on, on the technical side and worked with the with our consulting team. So um, there was a whole range of, of different things, um, but but the we didn't provide funding for other engineering teams or consultants. Uh, we just support we had the support directly um, at no cost. With our with our technical assistance team. One okay, the reason I, somebody wants yeah go so ahead. The, the reason behind that was primarily um, we well a couple of things uh, we were very pleased with the the team we were able to put together. It also allowed us to move a little more quickly with the technical assistance. Um, we we're really focused on moving as as much as we could towards project implementation and by offering the services at no cost, we could eliminate the step of municipal procurement of uh, engineering or consulting team. And um, we also were able to sort of standardize the output of the, the reports and um, sort of the, what the focus of the analysis was by, by having our, offering our own um, assistance team. Okay, great. Uh, somebody wanted to know what the dollar value is for the 13 applications submitted. I don't know um, whether that means the grant dollar or the total. Well, I'll, um, I'll hold off until we make an award announcement on that. Um, it's a significant amount of money, um, and we're, we're quite pleased with the, the amount and the, the, all the projects that came in, but um, I'll hold off for now on that one. Sure. I mean, actually, I was sort of curious about a similar question that you might be able to answer. Is there, can you give a, a sense of the range of total, uh, you know, costs for these projects? So obviously they, they range from single, small single facility or, you know, even something as small as a cell tower up to microgrids. So it's got to be a pretty large range. I'm just, just curious, did you get a sense of, uh, you know, sort of the range of overall, not the grant amounts, but the overall project um, costs? Yeah, it is, it's really broad, you're right. Um, it could be anything from uh, just looking at islanding equipment, maybe a facility already had good generation in place um, and just wanted to island and operate, so that would be significantly less money than, like you said, a, a microgrid configuration. 
Um, so we're talking at the, a, a few, couple hundred thousand dollars all the way to a, a few million dollars. Um, and that, that would be in the funding requests on, uh, for, from us. And you know, some of those projects could extend to, to many millions um, with other aspects of them that we, we wouldn't cover. Um, you know, we're looking at, again, at the, uh, the clean technology and resiliency aspects of a project, but it might be a bigger scale. For example, even in the first round for Bay State Health, um, their hospital, they're putting in new, uh, I think it's five megawatts, uh, don't quote me on that one, though, um, of cogeneration, co which is uh, many, uh, ten, I think around the total project cost, I think, was in the $10 million range, roughly. But we would support the islanding and Black Star capability. So that while that one was a large sum in the first round, the broader project cost was quite high. So um, yeah, a, a really broad range and um, different funding sources to make these all these projects work. Great. Uh, somebody wants to know whether you're tracking or estimating uh, CO2 reductions that might occur from these projects. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a specific target for these projects, although in Massachusetts for any, um, any project that would come in for our renewable portfolio standard incentives, we would be able to track that way um, the energy generation from those facilities and thereby make some assumptions about CO2 emission reductions. Um, but it wasn't a, a specific target of, of this initiative, uh, and so we didn't keep, take specific note in, in the sort of evaluation of applications, for example, of estimates of save, those, those savings. But okay. It's certainly important to, to our agency in general. Right. Uh, here's an interesting question, and I, I don't know if you can really answer this, but uh, the person wants to know if you can elaborate on what you did in this program differently from uh, the Connecticut microgrids program and other programs, and why. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I guess I don't want to speak for other programs, but I did certainly, as I mentioned, uh, take the opportunity to to try to talk to the different, uh, particularly Connecticut and other regional um, agencies that were working on these similar types of projects. Uh, in Connecticut, for example, they are specifically a microgrid project, and we decided that we would allow for smaller, single facility uh, projects as well as microgrid. So that's uh, sort of one clear difference. Um, we're also, our funding was focused around clean energy technology. So so we really only looked at projects that use the, that sort of generation, um, whereas some other states al allowed for different types of generation. Um, and I, I guess you know we each have our own twist on, on and our own goals. But uh, but again, I think we I, we were able to learn from Connecticut, and I, I think. Um, Hopefully, we'll all others can learn from us as well. Yeah, I think this is this is really a, still a very new, um, you know, area of endeavor for for states, and everyone's learning. <clears throat> and and you know, we've looked at the a, a number of different programs, and they're all you know they they all have a different, slightly different approach. And they they look at. Uh, yeah, there's, there, there are many things in common, of course, but uh, there are differences, and I think we're, we're all trying to, uh, everyone's trying to learn from each other, as well as from their own experiences. Um, it, another really interesting question, when you evaluated the projects, did you put a value on the resiliency benefits, and if so, how were those resiliency benefits valued? I presume the question is around sort of economic value of resiliency benefits, and we didn't uh, try to specifically quantify the what those benefits would be. Um, again, the target was that uh, three-day, longer-term outage support, and ensuring that we thought we 
the project could support the estimated or, or identified critical load at the facility um, and, and could really be able to offer the public services that, that the facility could offer throughout that outage. Um, so we didn't sort of make an exercise of, of quantifying those costs or benefits um, directly, but more around whether or not the system could perform the way we were hoping to. Uh, I, I think uh, I, you know, obviously recognize that to as we go forward with these sorts of resiliency efforts, we are going to need to be able to, if we're going to finance them beyond grant programs, um, state support grant programs, then we are going to need to quantify all of those things. And I hope that the projects that we're doing can really be serve as an, another example of um, of that. You know, I spoke a little earlier about these being almost demonstration projects, but we'll certainly be looking to track how well the projects perform on both a daily basis and an emergency, and then uh, perhaps come to some conclusion on on those specifically quantified financial benefits uh, of the projects. Okay, uh, we have some. We are getting some really good questions here. Uh, another good one: um, How were existing emergency response and hazard mitigation plans factored into the selection of the projects, or were they? And if so, how were they? Um, yes, they were certainly factored in. Um, we did ask applicants to sort of indicate, uh, you know, how this facility, how their the facility was prioritized. Um, in their emergency plan, in the utility emergency restoration plan, um, that's something that Massachusetts requires that each municipality file with their utility. Um, so there's a prioritized list of how, of how the utility would go in should an outage occur. Um, the order, essentially, of the facilities that need to be re-powered. Uh, um, so th those things were taken into consideration. And then if there was even broader things like hazard mitigation planning, um, even resiliency assessments, um, then which a, a few applicants did had already conducted. Um, of course, all those were factored in and um, certainly beneficial to an applicant should, had they completed those things. Um, and more convincing to us that you know this project uh, was feasible and realistic and um, well thought out should should those plans be in place. Okay, great. Uh, and another good question about the, the reviewing process. When you were reviewing applications, did you did you look at the business cases for the projects? Or if not, will you be looking at the business cases as these projects are implemented? Yeah, I think that gets a little bit back to the um, question of quantifying the resiliency benefits. And um, yes and no. I mean, we certainly uh, asked that applicants provide all, look to and, and identify and incorporate all other financial revenue sources and resources in general for a project. Um, you know, we were looking to fund, obviously, support of a project, but, but um, spread the funding around as much as possible and therefore try to re reduce the amount that we offered um, if, if, if at all possible. So taking advantage of all, sorts, all of the incentives that Massachusetts or the federal government offered and as well as other um, revenue streams that we spoke of and things like that. Um, but certainly we will be needing to look and track and, um, and work with the applicants as we go forward to understand the operation and, and the benefits on a daily basis and a, uh, in an emergency, as I mentioned earlier, to try to, to quite quantify the benefits and costs and then, um, well, I guess we know the cost, but quantify the benefits and then, and then make move to the business case for resiliency. Okay, very good. Well, I think this has to be the last question because we're at the end of our hour and several people have asked this. Uh, you know, will there be another round of this program, or will there, will there be a, a follow-up uh, program? Well, we, we don't have anything to announce about that just now. Um, you know, certainly we're, we're working through what, where we are with this second round, um, and then 
we'll, we'll see, um, people may know that the Massachusetts is at a change of administration at the end of this year, so a lot will depend on, on how that goes and what the priorities are of the next administration. So I know, I think, I don't think resiliency will go away as an important issue, but, um, but we don't have any commitment as of yet to, for further rounds. So we, we shall see. Okay, very good. Well, I want to thank you very much, Amy, for your presentation. And uh, to the people whose questions we did not get to, I, I apologize. Uh, we do have a limited amount of time. Uh, feel free to email me or Amy. I mean, we had her, her, um, we put her email back up for a moment. Um, she was kind enough to provide that. Uh, if you have a burning question, and uh, there you go. And again, uh, there will be more details on these projects at the website URL that's listed here on the, on the screen for the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. And of course, this webinar will be, uh, has been recorded and will be archived with all of our webinars uh, at our website, if we can get that slide up, um, resilientpower.org. And uh, we have, a, of course, a related project or energy storage project. And so we have webinars for, for these projects going back now uh, over uh, more than two years. And uh, the archives are available for you to, uh, to look at uh, at your leisure. So we hope that you will uh, do that. And Samantha, do we have any upcoming webinars that you want to announce before we end this up? We have several upcoming webinars, actually. Um, we have one on Monday about economic development and job growth in Massachusetts and New Mexico. And um, we have um, a bunch more. You can find all the details on the Clean Energy States Alliance website, which is cesa.org backslash webinars. OK, very good. Well, I think that's it then for this one. And thanks to everybody who joined. Thanks very much to Amy McGuire. And uh, we'll call this a webinar. Bye, everybody.